Hello and welcome to the Pro Water Workflow by Land Kit, where we will be exploring all of the pro features of Water Kit. We will be focusing on the pro features today, so if you're interested in learning about some of the free features of Water Kit, or if you see something that we brush over that looks important and you don't understand, please refer to the free water workflow tutorial video. So for this video and this workflow, we'll be keeping our Grasshopper canvas minimized down the corner and we'll be manipulating that canvas and Grasshopper script using the workflow dashboard here. We also have a series of layers already set up for you to utilize and we'll be talking about some of those layers as we go through this workflow. So the first tab you see here is the info tab and this info tab gives us some information about how this workflow functions, some tips and tricks, and also some descriptions of the layer structure and how those work as well. The topo tab is a way of manipulating some of the topography that we're seeing here in our, uh, in our Rhino file and um, through the grasshopper. And we've talked a little bit about this in the free water workflow. So we're just gonna talk about these uh, two new selections here in the topo tab. We've shifted the contour um, preview and intervals over here to this tab, the topo tab. And we've also allowed for you to turn on and off the swales and paths. And we're gonna keep that off for now just so that we can uh, see the topo a little bit easier and the water flow. So the main focus of this uh, workflow is the analysis tab. And you can see we have some familiar dropdowns from the free topo workflow, upslope area, slope, um, faceted, which is similar to the slope preview that we saw in the free workflow, but we also have a slope diffuse layer, which uh, shows us a little bit more of the subtlety between those slopes, less as a facet and more as sort of a, uh, a, a diffused mesh. We also have elevation and then a couple of new drop downs here that you haven't seen yet. The first one is the flow intensity. The nice part about the flow intensity is it allows us to really understand the amount of flow lines that are uh, passing through a particular location on the mesh. So while we can sort of visual, visually see that there's lots of flow lines in one particular area, this actually uh, joins those together into a value that we can actually understand and visualize on the mesh itself. So you can see that even though maybe the flow lines show um, the water flowing the same amount on both sides, we can visually see that the amount of water flowing through the swale on this left-hand side of the site is actually a lot more substantial than the right-hand site. And so there's a lot of ways that we can sort of manipulate that intensity because that intensity reveals some uh, things about uh, what could potentially happen on our site, such as erosion, um, uh, if we kept it the way it is. So manipulating some of these basins could be helpful to um, offload some of the water earlier in order to capture and prevent that intensity from being too great. So maybe we select some of these and we drop these down to allow that water to flow into that basin a little bit easier. And then what we end up with is maybe a reduction in the, uh, the intensity of the blue here that's coming after the basin. You can see it's not really affecting it that much. Maybe it's just not substantial enough or maybe we need to make greater changes to our site in order to handle that type of flow intensity. And you can see that we have some diffuse steps in intensity, and this is really the controllers for visualizing uh, the detail of the, uh, the flow intensity that we're seeing across our mesh. So we can adjust some of these parameters in order to sort of visualize more detail or less detail depending on the size of our site or depending on how detailed we really wanna understand that flow intensity across our site. So moving on to static storage, and this one is probably a little bit more applicable to what we're trying to achieve when we're creating basins across our site, which um, we've talked about in the free week workflow and how we're creating those across our site. But the nice part here is that we're actually seeing a gradient of how much water is being captured in each of these locations. So we're really getting an understanding of um, which basins are capturing more water or less water. But more importantly, we're seeing the values in cubic feet for each basin. So if we switch back here to the top view, we can see that each basin is capturing a specific amount of water um, based on sort of the top edge of that basin flowing into the basin. And then also we have a value here that represents the overall total, total static storage of all of our basins. And the, the static storage is really gonna collect from the uh, basin layer here. So understanding where on our, our site those basins are located and then utilizing those depressions in order to calculate those values. The nice part here too is that we can make adjustments to our basins using our basin depth and slope here and that will reflect on how much total static storage we're getting. So if I increase the depth from one foot to two feet, you'll notice that 
all of our basins get deeper, and then also our value of um, total stack storage increases quite a bit by 50% here. So we go from about 6,000 up to 9,000. And then even doing things like increasing the slope on the sides of the inside of our basins will allow us to capture more water as well. And you'll see that that value will increase from 9,000 to about 11,500. So we have a lot of ways of adjusting and increasing that static storage in order to capture the water on our site. But that still doesn't tell us how much water we're actually capturing on our site. And so if we can remember this value of 11,500, we can jump over into our volume dropdown. The volume dropdown is going to allow us to make a few things happen. It's going to allow us to understand the different soil conditions on our site and analyze them. And then it's also going to use those values and those different um, soil conditions and uh, allow us to understand the amount of water flowing on our site uh, based on certain um, uh, types of storm events. And then and then utilize that information along with our um, some of our site conditions and soil conditions to actually determine how much water is flowing across our site in different locations and catchments. So here, um, we're gonna drop down to here first and talk about the peak runoff parameters. So what this allows us to do is it, if we click this, it will open up a, uh, a browser that allows us to actually identify where we're at in, um, in the world. And that will allow us to capture some information about our, uh, our specific site. So if we go here, and I believe our site is located in Philly, if we jump over to Philadelphia, and maybe we click just you know right on top of our site, wherever that is. But for now, we're just going to say that our site is somewhere here, um, you know, to the uh, to the west of Philadelphia, um, and we can get some uh, we can acquire some information about our storm events. So for instance, the occurrence. We'll we'll go for a, a 100 year storm at 24 hours and we can see that value is 7.66 um, inches of uh, water here so this allows us to take this value and come back over to our uh, grasshopper and rhino file and we can place that 7.66 here into this um, selection hit the refresh button and that will tell us across our entire site where uh, the amount of water during a 100 year storm event is about 39,900 cubic feet of water and then additionally we're getting sort of a breakdown in our catchment area. So our layer to preview here is currently our catchment areas. We're getting a, a preview of how much, how much of that water is being, um, is flowing across each of the different catchment areas. So if you zoom in a little bit here, you can see, you know, we're getting some low point and high point um, views for each catchment. So we can actually understand where our high and low points are in each of our catchments. And then we can actually have for the different color schemes, uh, very similar to the free workflow, but a little bit more detailed because we're getting it as a diffuse layer. Um, where those catchments are, where the high point and low points are on those catchments, and then also how much cubic feet of water is flowing across each of those catchments. So this is a super handy way of understanding each of the different zones on our site. It might give us a little bit more um, guidance for using our pipes. So if I think that this is not capturing enough water and I really wanna combine that with another basin and create a larger catchment area, I can create that pipe from basin to basin and then all of a sudden it combines those catchments into a single catchment and recalculates those values of the, uh, the amount of water flowing across that catchment. So this is, a, this is a really handy way of understanding sort of the different zones and the amount of water flowing across the different zones and catchments on our site, which again, catchments can also be thought of as sort of watersheds on our site too. So that's super handy as well for understanding that relationship to our basins and the static storage. So if we know what each of our basins are capturing and we know how those are connect connected to our catchments, we can start to make sure that our basins are capturing the amount of water that's flowing across that particular catchment and into that basin so that we're really capturing all of that water on our site. Uh, so we also have these, these values here that I'm gonna talk about as we go through. The first thing I wanna talk about is what are these CN values and what do they mean and how are they being uh, joined together to create these overall understanding of our water area. So first of all, um, we can talk about uh, our HSG. So the HSG is the different soil condition or the soil types from sandy to clay. It is understood as um, a standardized uh, set of letter values here from A to D, A being the sandy soils and D being the clay soil. So if I select this, you can see we've, we've outlined that this area up here is um, the more clay soils. 
and uh, some of our areas, our basins here on the sides are more sandier soils. And we've also created some of these bees, which are slightly less sandy, loamy soils. And then um, we don't have any seas across our site, but if I hold my cursor over top of this dropdown, you can see that we have a few representations of our default values. So for the HSG layer, if we do not define a specific zone, it will be defined as a sea soil condition or a soil HSG. So moving on to the uh, ground cover. So the ground cover is utilizing the different, uh, the different uh, surface types in order to define the different layers on our site, which affect our CN values and ultimately sort of um, how our water is flowing across our site. So our default will be lawn. So if we don't specify a specific type, it will be lawn. But you can also see that we've outlined a specific set. So we have some impervious up here. We have some meadow conditions in our basins. We also have some woods in our central basins as well. Okay, so those are being uh, joined together too in our water area. So you can see we're getting our soil condition, we're getting our, um, our surface type, and then we're also getting the condition of our soil. Um, this can be outlined here in our condition. We don't have these specifically outlined on our site, but if you uh, see the drop down, the condition default is defaulted to good. So if you actually know the conditions of your soils, you can outline those on your site and those will be taken into consideration for the amount of water that is flowing um, across our site um, in these values. So all of these different factors come together to create the CN values here. So if I drop down and show the CN values, this is represented in these, uh, you can see here in this area, we have these different values that are represented. And all of the different conditions that we're bringing together are being uh, joined to sort of create the analysis of our CN value. And the CN value is really an understanding of how the water is draining across and out of our site. So it's, it's really the stormwater runoff potential for our drainage area or our different catchment areas. So these values um, are really a good way of understanding how water is going to flow across your site and run off of the site as well. A sort of easy way of understanding how these values work is that the higher the number is, the more impervious the, the, um, the surface will act in terms of stormwater runoff. So obviously an impervious surface um, uh, from the, the ground, the GC layer here, will have a much higher CN value, even if the soils underneath are very sandy. Um, but uh, there will be also certain conditions where maybe you have clay soils or things like that that might still have a very high CN value. So the lower the CN value, the more likely that the water is going to absorb into the soil, the higher, the more likely it's going to create more runoff. So we can actually see some of these shapes too. We can actually start to preview what some of these shapes look like in 2D. and 3D and, and sort of visualize uh, what those different um, C and values are across the site. And uh, we also have a selection here for seeing grid flow, which is really uh, creating a, a grid across the site that generates the flow lines. And these are the, uh, these are the actual values that are being utilized additionally with the C and values as well. So once you have all this information together, you can actually export this to a CSV in order to give a much more data-oriented understanding of the different uh, locations across your site if you're doing certain types of analysis. So uh, once you hit export there, you can actually export this CN and name it and place it in a folder, and it will come out as a CSV that you can see here is sort of organized by the catchments and the different, um, and the different conditions across your site and uh, different area sizes and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of outputs here that are very beneficial for understanding what's going on on your site. And again, since we have a total volume of about almost 40,000 cubic feet of, of water flowing across our site during a 100 year storm, and if you remember, we are catching about 11,500, we would probably need to make some changes to our site in order to be able to capture all the water in a 100 year storm. And then lastly, we have our outputs, which are similar to the free workflow, our baking of our flow lines, our baking of our topography, and then we have our saving and loading parameters as well, as well as our, um, our loading and saving of our options. Thank you so much. And if you'd like more information about these workflows or other parts of LandKit, please visit our website at landkit.design. Um, also visit our campus page where you can download more workflows or learn a little bit more about the components and details and um, tutorials and templates of LandKit. And 
Lastly, every Friday from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern Time, uh, a member of the Landau team will be available for free at our office hours where you can uh, get some tips and tricks or some guidance and troubleshooting for any of your land kit needs.